Hi everyone. This is Lindsay Shepard, Investigative Journalism Fellow with True North, and today I am interviewing Dr. Francis Widowson. Dr. Francis Widowson is Associate Professor in the Department of Economics, Justice, and Policy Studies at Mount Royal University in Calgary, Alberta. Her first book, co-authored with Albert Howard and published in 2008, is called Disrobing the Aboriginal Industry, The Deception Behind Indigenous Cultural Preservation. Her second book, also co-edited with Albert Howard, was published in 2013 and is called Aboriginal Education in Canada, Searching for Solutions. Her third book is called Separate but Unequal, How Parallelist Ideology Conceals Indigenous Dependency, and it is coming out on November 5th, 2019 with the University of Ottawa Press. We will be going into what parallelism means and what the book is about in this podcast today. But first, for a bit of context, Francis and I have been connected for, I suppose, about a year and a half now. Francis runs the Rational Space Network at Mount Royal University, and she told me the name, uh, Rational Space Network, it's a play on safe space, you know. So instead of a safe space, we have a rational space to discuss ideas and current events. I was a panelist with the Rational Space Network almost about a year ago now, in November 2018. That was on the topic of, should universities vet who speaks on campus? where I argued no, university administration should not vet who speaks on campus. So I can definitely tell you from firsthand experience, Francis has a great group of students, staff, and faculty over at Mount Royal University who are dedicated to creating a rational space on campus. And back when I was a graduate student at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario in 2017-2018, I ran a club called the Laurier Society for Open Inquiry and Frances was one of our speakers in May 2018. She spoke on the question of, does university indigenization threaten open inquiry? And Wilfrid Laurier actually charged us about $5,300 in security fees to host Frances. There was indeed a protest outside the building, and I think my favorite memory actually from running that student club for the year was seeing the Marxist protesters yelling at Frances about how the working class needs to rise up. And Francis was trying to engage in a dialogue with these protesters, but, you know, of course, they're trying to drown her out. But Francis, what she was yelling across to them was, I agree with you, because I believe uh, Francis herself supports socialist policies. We might be going into that later in this podcast. So let's get into why Francis, a university professor who supports free speech, open inquiry, rational discussion, and rigorous research, is controversial enough to be inspiring masked protesters and a $5,300 security fee to speak at a university. Francis, when did this all start? Why do you get protested? And why do you get accused of spreading hate speech and the like? Um, It's it's an interesting question. Um, The first time I actually had this occur was in 2008. And this was before Disrobing the Aboriginal Industry came out when I was giving a presentation at the Canadian Political Science Association in Vancouver. And what occurred at that presentation was that um, uh, a political scientist yelled at me during the presentation and asked, screamed at me, why do you hate Indigenous people? And um, I asked the chair to restore order. It was quite a confrontational session. And I thought this professor uh, was completely out of line in what she was doing. And I just went back uh, to my work and I found out after the fact that a group of political scientists who belong to the Women's Caucus of the Canadian Political Science Association were actually contemplating on um, some kind of listserv uh, as to whether or not to have me charged under hate speech uh, with respect to what I was presenting at the session, which was essentially about whether indigenous theories and methodologies were um, rigorous enough to contribute to the discipline of political science. So it was quite an academic uh, argument that I was making, but it was seen as being hateful by many of the political scientists there. So that gives you a bit of a sense of the kind of um, environment which many are operating in right now. And so that was the beginning of that sort of activity. It's kind of continued on, on and off up until uh, today. 
Um, it started to become very, very serious, I guess, in around 2016 um, because of the indigenization initiative and the demand that indigenous perspectives, worldviews, ways of knowing should be valued at Canadian universities. So that that's now become institutionalized. It was it was emerging in 2008. And now with indigenization, it's become institu institutionalized. So it's very, very difficult for anyone to be able to criticize um, the perspectives that are being put, put forward by indigenous people, because that's seen as being um, demeaning to indigenous people, an attempt to oppress indigenous people. So that kind of environment is what um, creates the climate whereby it, it becomes very, very difficult for anyone to challenge what's being put forward at universities today. Yeah, I, I believe you're one of the very few voices out there that is pushing back against mandated Indigenous land acknowledgements, for example, pushing back against indigenization initiatives at universities. So you've mentioned kind of how they can stifle discussion. Do you have any other concerns when it comes to the rise of land acknowledgements and university indigenization programs? Yeah, so the land acknowledgements, um, I've been discussing them at Mount Royal um, for a number of years now. Uh, the the main issue with them, well, there's a number of issues, but the first thing is that I, I completely understand why someone might have that political perspective. So they think that it's important to recognize Indigenous peoples um, in, in, in inhabiting these traditional territories. Um, they have perspectives on decolonization. So, you know, that that is a, a fundamental part of academic freedom, freedom of expression to put forward uh, your support for that in, in whatever context that you want to. The difficulty comes when the university has a mandated uh, territorial land acknowledgement and makes it appear as if this territorial land acknowledgement is something that all people agree with. Um, and this happened at Mount Royal University. Uh, the president at the time, David Dougherty, um, said to us, and I remember it very clearly, um, we're not going to have any discussion about this because it's just the right thing to do. And I was absolutely uh, amazed by him saying that because uh, universities is where we try to decide what the right thing to do is. The, the right thing to do is an area of contestation. And by him saying that, he was making an official position as to what was quote unquote right. And in my view, this is uh, politically correct totalitarianism, which is um, people decide what is right. You are told that this is right. If you disagree with this, then you suffer all sorts of um, uh, punishments of various kinds. They, they might be official or they might just be, you're looked upon as a immoral person who's trying to oppress others and so on. Um, so that, that's the big issue uh, in terms of the official nature of it. And personally, I oppose the territorial land acknowledgements because politically, I don't agree with the framework out of which they arise, which is the idea that indigenous people are the original landowners, um, everyone else is a settler, um, and this, um, sets up a situation whereby uh, people feel that they are they they almost have a a, a, a status another status a, a, a subordinate status to the indigenous landowners um, and i think that it, it gives a, a the wrong impression to indigenous people because many many of my colleagues are doing this because they just think that it's a great way symbolically to recognize indigenous people when, if you look at some of the things that Indigenous people say, it, it's really the idea that they are the landowners and that in, non-Indigenous people are the guests. And so there's there's bound to be uh, misunderstandings that are going to arise from this. And then Indigenous people are going to be very angry when they find out that many people have been doing this just to um, symbolically recognize Indigenous people and might even see it as a manipulative strategy. And... The real big issue with Indigenous, non-Indigenous relations is the serious social problems and deprivation that exists in these isolated Indigenous communities. That's really what we should be concerned about, and that is really what 
territorial land acknowledgements are somehow pretending to address. And it makes no difference to isolated Indigenous communities as to whether or not um, people symbolically recognize that they inhabited the land first. So I think it's a distraction from trying to actually address the serious social conditions that exist in Indigenous communities. Yeah, so I think that's, that's a great point. Um, and then if I can jump in, just, I mean, these Indigenous land acknowledgements, there are many examples of them being mandated. I mean, um, at Wilfrid Laurier University, the English department said that every single syllabus for every course in the English department had to have the land acknowledgement uh, on the top of the syllabus. Um, and then this isn't only happening in universities, it's happening in, in public schools too. So the Toronto District School Board, they do a land acknowledgement over the uh, announcements at school. I, I think it might be, I don't know if it's every morning, maybe once a week in the morning. Um, but so, Francis, you've, you've um, said kind of some of your positions on these issues. What is, how are you treated um, in general by your academic colleagues for saying these things? What, so one person yelled at you in 2008 that, well, you know, why do you hate Indigenous people? And it, I mean, it sounds like you have, actually, you are concerned about the, the living conditions and things. You just don't bother with, uh, let's say, superficial matters. Um, so what other kinds of feedback, what other kinds of reactions are you encountering? Yeah, so I, I've been interacting with people quite a lot, actually, over the last few years. Um, much of this, of course, is not said to my face, uh, which is, of course, is a problem, because then we cannot really openly discuss many of these uh, differences of opinion which exist. Generally, I think uh, most uh, people who are critical of me, um, either they try to smear my reputation with accusations of racism, so and that's a tactic, as far as I can tell, to really stop discussion, because people are afraid of being called a racist. So if that becomes um, one of the consequences of speaking critically about what's occurring, people are going to be very reluctant uh, to be able to, to, to enter into the conversation. So that's sort of one tact uh, that's take, taken. Um, the other is um, the idea that what you're saying is hurtful, uh, and, and I'm encountering that more and more now. So um, it's recognized that Indigenous people terrible have suffered terrible treatment historically, and many people see the way to respond to this is to generally get out of the way and allow leave it up to Indigenous people to say what it is that is wrong with society. And if you uh, sort of start to question what an Indigenous person is saying, this shows that you're being disrespectful to Indigenous people um, because you're not really giving them control over the conversation. And I am very opposed to that approach. Um, I think that it really is um, harmful to Indigenous people, in fact, because how one learns, how one grows as a as a person, and in terms of your ideas, is through is by being challenged. But that's really you cannot uh, you cannot hone your ideas. You you cannot become more knowledgeable, gain uh, better understanding without being challenged. And so this is going to have a very very destructive impact on Indigenous people if they are just patronized all the time, um, which is what I see happening. And and this really is one of the main problems with the indigenization initiative, is that I can really get a sense that as soon as you start to question anything that is being argued, you come up against this idea that um, you are somehow disrespecting indigenous people. Right, and then when you were talking about the accusations of racism, I remembered um, it was either when it was your event or, or my event where we, uh, had each other invited where a professor from Mount Royal, I think he called you a pathetic racist. You know, this is one of your colleagues and he yes. called me, uh, what was it? Some sort of white nationalist sympathizer or something. Um, so yeah. <laughs> that's what's happening. Yes. So that's the extreme end of it. You know, most, most professors don't, uh, don't resort to that level. Um, but there definitely is uh, a feeling that it's inappropriate to question things that 
uh, something that an indigenous person says. And this is one of the big, big problems with indigenization. So I've been at a number of events now uh, where I've gone and listened to someone giving a presentation, an indigenous person giving a presentation on something to do with indigenizing part of the curriculum. And, and, I'll, and there's actually been three which stand out in my mind. Um, one was um, uh, an elder who was invited to give a talk on indigenous medicine. Um, another um, situation just happened um, recently, which was about um, star knowledge, uh, something to do with changing astronomy or contributing to astronomy classes. Cajete was the Gregory Cajete at the University of Calgary was the person who was giving the talk there. And then there was another case um, for Mount Royal when we we're talking about indigenizing a science course and an elder was speaking there. Um, and in terms of, of the first kind about the indigenous medicine, um, the, uh, someone asked a question from the audience and asked, um, what do you do about gut problems in children? So stomach problems in children. And the elder responded, um, you rub corn pollen on the child's feet and you do a sunrise ceremony. That's how you address those problems in terms of in indigenous medicine. Um, in terms of Cajete's talk, um, there were all sorts of spiritual beliefs about the stars that were presented, uh, that, that happened. And then in terms of uh, the other uh, case of indigenizing the biology course, the elder gave as one of the examples of indigenous knowledge was that um, when the trees come out of dormancy in the spring, the reason why they do that is because the birds are singing to the trees. And this was going to be taught in a, a camp environment where this elder was going to be teaching biology students. And in all of these cases, you know, I was there asking questions and I saw a whole bunch of colleagues there from the science, the faculty of science, who know very well that this is not knowledge. Um, this is at best folklore and, you know, sorts of very, very, you know, minor observations. Uh, that that aren't going to contribute uh, to the science discipline, disciplines in science, or their spiritual beliefs, um, which are actually uh, contrary to what is known. Uh, but no one says anything about this. Uh, right. I think along with it. Yeah, I, I think a point you've made before is um, universities otherwise are quite secular, but then they, we have this one exception of indigenous spirituality and folklore, as you were saying. Kind of being allowed to be yes. taught as the status quo. Yes, and 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 we're, what we're seeing is actually universities are becoming less secular. Um, the indigenization aspect is one part of that, but also we are coming up against very seriously, and this is something we can talk about with respect to the Rational Space Network, is Islamic ideology is becoming more and more um, integrated uh, with respect to the university. To the point, it's becoming very, very difficult to make any criticisms of Islam. So uh, I'm not sure where this began, uh, but certainly indigenization has been one of the avenues whereby secularism is under threat. And, and it used to be, un it would have been unheard of for a prayer to be held at a beginning of, a, of an event. That, that, would, that would never have happened. And now it's happening all the time. And, you know, I've been discussing this with my colleagues on the fa on the closed Facebook group and, uh, you know, sort of mentioning these things and saying this shouldn't be happening. And people who would not support that for any other uh, type of religious uh, activity uh, in, in a public setting, like this is not to say that people can't engage in prayers or whatever they want to do at the university if they organize it for that purpose. And people can go if they want to. But that's not what's happening. You're going to, uh, for example, the president of the university, when he was being invited, to, he had just become the new president. We all went there to listen to his, you know, the welcoming of him. And what do we have at the beginning? We have an indigenous prayer. And it's like, why is there an indigenous prayer as part of the welcoming of the president? That makes no sense. It has nothing to do with uh, the functioning of the university in terms of including everyone and the academic mandate of the university. This 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 is completely uh, at odds with what it is that we're trying to do at the university. Right. Yeah. Um, but you are, you know, 
again, pushing back a bit. So you're the founder of the Rational Space Network at the Mount Royal University campus. Um, yeah. Can you talk a bit about the work you do, um, your mandate, what events have you hosted, what events are coming up? Yes, yeah, so um, this is becoming more established now. Um, I believe I first thought about it, as you mentioned, um, after hearing, and it actually started off with positive space, that was the beginning, and now now it's morphed into safe space. And I, and I, I, I was sort of a little bit nervous about how this was all uh, unfolding, because it seemed to me that at a university, critical thinking, the, ad, the academic mandate is key, and all these kinds of feel good, we've got to celebrate this and celebrate that in, in terms of various identities, um, was in the end going to challenge what we were able to discuss at a university. So I was a bit nervous about these initiatives. Um, and so I, I sent out an email in 2016 just seeing if I could get some people together to sort of form a loosely organized group. Um, it didn't really go anywhere for quite a while. And then I guess it was last year I decided to, you know, uh, become more, um, you know, involved in trying to do something um, because of all the issues that were starting to emerge. And so um, there was a number of people who signed what was called the Rational Space Declaration, which is which is on our Facebook page and also on our Twitter account. And and they sort of basically had to look at those principles and see if they agreed with them. And, and they're generally talking about secularism, the importance of, of having a secular environment, the importance of being able to discuss contentious issues, um, the importance of the university not taking a political position on things, um, open inquiry being very important, uh, critical thinking and evidence-based uh, decision making and these are all specified in the declaration see if I, see if i could get some people to sign it i think i got around 15 people or so to sign it and then you know we started to think okay what we, should we do and and we um we organized what we called the critical thinking series which held a, a number of events in the in, in the last academic year israel palestine um your event which was about vetting speakers um, there was also one on capitalism, whether capitalism was sustainable. And then we had a very contentious event uh, with Megan Murphy and Julie Ray Goldstein on does trans activism negatively impact women's rights? And it was that last event which really brought out the different views on freedom of expression on campus because that was very, very strongly opposed by um, intersectional feminist elements on campus um, who were saying that it was hatred, that um, it amounted to denying the humanity of trans students. It was it was denying the, the and, and, and we're still suffering the fallout from that um, uh, event because um, there still is a large, well, I'm not sure how many, but probably around 20 professors. Who, who still think that that event should never be held and are to some extent mobilizing um, the trans activist element within the student body to see the professors who were involved with that event as harming students. And, and this is a really serious problem because um, if I'm harming students, then I probably should be subject to some kind of disciplinary process. And that's kind of always hanging over the, the head of the people who are associated with rational space, whether there'll be some kind of mobilization that will spark a disciplinary process. Um, so that was last year. It was very, very good. The events were excellent. They're all, they were all videotaped. They all can be watched on YouTube. This year, um, we're discussing the Chicago principles on November 1st. So that's going to be an event that's going to have both the supporters and the opponents of the Chicago principles have a discussion. And then um, we have um, Anthony Magnabosco, who does what's called street epistemology, uh, which is a very interesting method of asking questions to try to figure out why people hold uh, the beliefs that they do. And, and we're going to examine belief in God. Why, why is it that people believe in God? And then we're hoping to have a, a, an event on indigenization that it's going to include both science uh, and, and arts uh, faculty members um, probably in March, um, and that's the other event to, to examine whether you know indigenous ways of knowing um, enhance the curriculum 
those kinds of conversations. So those are the events that are, are planned uh, this year and, and, and they're all on our Facebook. Well, we haven't, the um, Chicago principal one, principals one is on the Facebook page, but as soon as we get things solidified for those other events, um, we will be posting information on them. So they're always open to the public, free and open to the public. Um, I think they're great events because what we try to do is we, we try to have the different sides of the position um, being expressed. So uh, many people in the Rational Space Network are, aren't really sure what to think about these issues. So the idea is, is just to create a space whereby the discussion can unfold, um, which I think has, has not been um, very possible in the past. And we're hoping that uh, we'll be able to now show that, you know, contentious events, uh, issues can be discussed um, and, and you can set it up in a way whereby it's not just like you're promoting uh, a, one of these contentious ideas. You're 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 wanting it to be challenged and to see where the, if there's any truth to what's being claimed. Right. Absolutely. And yeah, those are all great topics. And then I think I also saw you are having a little book release event. That's true. Coming out. Yeah. So um, your your next book it's called Separate but Unequal: How Parallelist Ideology Conceals Indigenous Dependency. Can you give us a bit of a preview? Maybe you could include a definition of parallelism in there. Yeah, sure. So on November 6th at Mount Royal University um, from 5 to 7 p.m., that's when the book is going to be launched. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, this book has been um, researched, rewritten um, over the last 10 years. Massive amounts of research have gone into it to try to address the criticisms of the position that's put forward in the book, which is very controversial, um, and to some extent follows from my dissertation. So the book is based upon my dissertation, which was completed in 2006, and I've essentially been rewriting it uh, to address criticisms ever since, and also to really tighten it up. So the book is, has really um, benefited from all the criticisms that have been made um, from various people over the years. And basically, the book is talking about uh, why it is that Indigenous people uh, became dependent. Um, so that means that dependent on transfers of various kinds. And it connects this, uh, this consequence to capitalism, developments that have happened in capitalism. So the argument is, is that um, capitalism in its early stages, uh, which was the fur trade, was a mercantilist type of capitalist process, which um, really was extensive development. So it just expanded across the country um, and it didn't really dramatically change the nature of indigenous societies because it was expansive in its character. With the transition to industrial capitalism, um, which really required intensive forms of development, so changing the labor process to make the lab labor more productive. Um, and this became much more difficult for cultures which are associated with hunting and gathering, the hunting and gathering horticultural mode of production. And it was this difficulty in making the transition and the characteristics of indigenous culture, the indigenous cultural features which are associated with hunting and gathering and horticulturalism, um, which made uh, it difficult for Indigenous people to enter into the labor force. And as, these are difficulties that still exist today with respect to the isolated Indigenous communities. And that's very, very important to point out because usually the Indigenous people that you hear from in the media are Indigenous people who are completely integrated in modern society. They're not the isolated Indigenous people who are suffering terribly in the communities um, who um, really need to have some kind of developmental strategy to be able to enable them to be able to participate in modern society. And so in terms of parallelism, this is the ideology that has come about since the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples was, the report for the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples was, was released in 1996. And my dissertation was actually on the Royal Commission, the arguments of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. And this is where we saw the ideology of parallelism became become firmly established in uh, universities, um, in um, the media, and so on. And what parallelism is, is this nation-to-nation -nation type of way of viewing Indigenous, non-Indigenous relations, which is 
You have indigenous nations, which are going to be following a particular path. Um, the Canadian nation following its own path. They're going to all have their different ways of doing things and, and they're really not going to interact at any kind of fundamental level. And really what parallelism says is that the reason why indigenous people became dependent was because their culture was not respected uh, by the dominant society. So if we could just learn to respect indigenous culture, then these cultures would become revitalized. These nations would be able to rebuild themselves and this would then um, be able to address um, all the various problems that are plague, plaguing these isolated communities. And so the book is, is really criticizing that ideological perspective and showing how this, ide this ideology is really preventing us from understanding really the, the main reason why indigenous people continue to be dependent, which is that the cultural features that are associated with hunting and gathering and horticultural societies are less developed than those of modern nation states. And because those cultural characteristics are being re retained, it makes it very, very difficult for indigenous people to enter into the labor force, for them to participate in modern political processes and probably most significantly, and this kind of comes up head, head up against indigenization, is that there is a lack of scientific education in indigenous cultures. So in order for indigenous people to be able to understand what's happening in the world, scientific education is required. But parallelist ideology argues that, you know, science is a, is a kind of a colonialist um, kind of method and you know, indigenous ways of knowing is really what's required in, in indigenous societies. And, and that is a very, very destructive uh, type of thought process that's going on, which is really preventing any kind of attempt to address, uh, to fundamentally address indigenous dependency. Okay. And, and I recall, um, so earlier in this interview, you talked a bit about um, this term, politically correct totalitarians which I, I think you prefer to use over social justice warriors. Is that right? That's true. And, and the reason for that, and, and this is a major problem that we are encountering now in the battles for free speech uh, across the country, is that people think that the opponents of free speech are quote unquote left wing. And this has led the free speech uh, movement to be seen as right wing. Uh, and, and this is a huge mistake. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with social, you know, pursuing social justice. Like I would argue that I'm uh, trying to pursue social justice. I'm trying to ensure that indigenous people have access to the same resources and, and services that all people uh, in the world, in fact, should have access to. So there's nothing wrong with pursuing social justice. The problem is, is when, when people who are doing this uh, say that their way of doing it is the right way and everyone else is evil and therefore those people shouldn't be allowed to speak. Uh, and in fact, this kind of idea came about in the 1960s uh, with a theorist by the name of Herbert Marcuse um, who wrote an article uh, called Repressive Tolerance. And I think that's the root of this. Is I think I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it is, but I, I, I always hear Marcuse brought up and in, in discussions about this, and, and it was a very, very destructive argument which was being put forward by him, which was that, um, you know, you had to stop um, right-wing ideas from being expressed because these right-wing ideas would have a destructive, uh, you know, effect on society, uh, and therefore, um, and of course, you know, who's going to decide it was not a problem for him because, he had this notion that this was just self-evident as to what the right ideas were and what the destructive ideas were. So um, that kind of notion, and Marcuse, of course, was part of the Frankfurt School, which was um, the new, quote, part of the quote-unquote new left, which in my view is not left-wing at all, um, because left-wing uh, thought historically was in favor of free speech, because uh, the idea was is that that's the way that you're gonna convince people that capitalism was oppressive. You, you would need to have freedom of expression to be able to do that. And it was often, you know, the interests that were associated with capitalist interests that were trying to shut down speech. Um, but what happened, I guess, in the 1960s with Marcuse and the Frankfurt School and so on is that 
um, we saw the emergence of postmodern relativism come on the scene um, because the left was 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 sort of doubting itself, and you know the you know, now left wing thought really is has been taken over by the university system, which is more concerned about you know who's getting the university jobs. That's that's basically what much of this has to do with, um, as opposed to trying to um, you know organized. Uh, members of the working class um, so that we can have a, a society that is able to uh, distribute resources equitably to all people around the world. So class, which was the foundations of left-wing thought, has now been completely under undermined by what's called intersectionality. Uh, and I'd never even heard of intersectionality until a couple of years ago. And now I'm just starting to hear about it all over the place, which really reduces class to just one variable amongst what appears to be hundreds, uh, you know, religion and age and disability and trans matters and um, all these different kinds of factors, which just completely waters down any sort of understanding of what the real source of conflict in society is. So, you know, I, I really think what's happened is the left has been taken over by this postmodern identity politics, uh, you know, kind of ideology. And then what happens is people say, well, these left wing people, these these are people claiming to be left wing, are complete totalitarians. Well, I don't want to be a part of anything to do with left wing kind of politics, because they're the people who want to stop people from speaking all the time. And, and they're just, they just seem to be these really irrational and um, authoritarian types when what these people are arguing for has nothing to do with left-wing thought at all. So there's all this confusion which is existing. So, you know, I think what we really need to do is, is, is establish once again that freedom of expression is a fundamental uh, right that people have. If we stop people from speaking and, and being unable to say what they think is true, we're never going to be able to figure out what is what is the right way to proceed with respect to society so i think that's the major battleground now is to sort of say look free speech is not a right-wing cause free speech is a human uh is a necessity for human beings and in fact it is especially necessary for people on the left because it is it is them who really needs to be able to communicate uh, with large numbers of people and it's only a matter of time before um, the crackdown comes down upon people who are trying to advocate for a more just and uh, equitable society. Yeah, and I think it's interesting what you said about Herbert Marcuse. Um, my oh. my bachelor degree in communication from Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. Um, you know, the whole theoretical framework behind my degree was the Frankfurt School. Um, mm. And I did hear about this, um, something similar. It's Karl Popper's paradox of tolerance. So uh, I think it's it's almost the same as repressive tolerance, the idea that liberal societies actually have to be inherently illiberal because they need to be they need to treat illiberal ideas illiberally as to not let them rise, which was, as you were saying, are the kind of right wing ideas. They have to be suppressed. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we will uh, we're going to turn towards fascism. And that's yes. the idea behind that. Yes. And, and that's I have heard Popper. And it's interesting because, you know, I always sort of saw Popper as a philosopher who was a promoter of science and reason and so on. And, and I'm not quite sure philosophically what's happening with this, uh, but I think it's perhaps confusing ideas with action. You know, like we just because you're allowing a fascist to express their ideas doesn't mean that you inevitably will be forced to implement fascism. And I, and I think that, that uh, making that argument means that it's, it's possible that fascism has some truth to it. Like, you know, as far as I'm concerned, there's no one is going to, well, I guess I'm going to have to hear the arguments, but it, it's going to be very, very unlikely that someone is going to be able to convince me that, you know, the fascist program is beneficial and that we should do it. Um, and so I, you know, to some extent, trust the ability for me to hear fascist arguments 
because I know that I'm going to be able to respond to them in a way to be able to defeat them. But I can't stop people from speaking because if I do, that means that I already know the truth before I've heard the arguments. And, and that's really kind of what we have to understand is that, you know, people who seem to want to shut down speech, I think, are not very confident in their ideas. Uh, and therefore, they the only recourse that they have is to stop people from speaking because they're really not all that aware of what all the arguments are and what the uh, opposition to those arguments are. That That's why they don't want people to speak is because they think that somehow this is going to allow these ideas to take root and then we're going to be facing a, you know, a fascist uh, type of regime. But what really is necessary is for these ideas to be brought out into the open so that they can be defeated. And, and I really think that uh, this is what's required and, 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 and the politically correct totalitarian element um, is, uh, is really uh, not allowing this to happen, which I think is going to be far, far more destructive um, because you're going to have all these ideas going underground and a whole bunch of frustrated people who can't express themselves. And even worse, you know, you have people who would potentially uh, have left wing ideas, but because all these totalitarians are stopping them from speaking, that actually drives them away from the left and makes them more likely to you know, become associates of white nationalists. Uh, and I, I see this happening, you know, and, and I guess Ricardo Duchenne is probably the best example of this, is that I think, you know, Ricardo Duchenne um, has some ideas which I disagree with, but he also has ideas which I do agree with. And, and I really would like to have the discussion to kind of find out where the truth lies. But because the totalitarian element have made it so impossible even to say that Duchenne should have the right to put forward his ideas, um, it's become impossible to try to arrange that kind of discussion or, or very, very difficult. You, you can sort of see what, what the kind of difficulties would be if you tried to organize some kind of forum to investigate his ideas. You would be immediately smeared as a white nationalist. Um, it would be, you know, it would be very, very difficult. Um, when, in fact, you know, what we need is to kind of figure out, you know, which of Duchenne's ideas, um, you know, have some merit, which which are flawed, um, th that sort of thing has to happen. But at this time, because of politically correct totalitarianism, uh, we haven't been able to do that. And as a result, the only people Duchenne is able to associate are with are white nationalists. So that's putting him in a little bit of an echo chamber. And so it's much more likely that he's going to become uh, have more strongly held white nationalist beliefs in that in, in under those conditions than if his ideas were opened up for scrutiny. Well, yeah. So um, Ricardo Duchenne, for those who don't know, he he was a professor, uh, I think, in sociology at the University of New Brunswick. And I think his his views on um, Canada being a, a white majority country, let's say, to say it briefly, they started to become public, and Huffington Post in the UK, I think this is where it where it all started, um, yeah. the kind of final mobbing of <laughs> Ricardo Duchenne. Yes. Um, so the UK Huffington Post, they they published an article calling him Canada's professor of white supremacy or something like that, and a whole bunch of professors signed a petition. Uh, I I guess the goal was to ultimately get him fired, um, and he did end up resigning. I don't know what happened there. Um, I think I heard you say in another podcast it sounds like maybe he was bought off. Yeah, it's likely. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what happened, but um, you know, the university. That's usually what happens. Gave him an incentive to retire, and because he was having so many difficulties with his colleagues. Um, he decided to go that route, which, you know, was good for him because he got a payout for it, I assume. I'm, I'm, I'm just speculating here. I don't know anything about it. I don't know right. Duchenne personally at all. I've just been following his case from an academic standpoint. Um, but the, the danger is, is that, you know, that means that we can't really have that discussion about his ideas at this point. have been made, uh, the constraints are immense to say, okay, I think we should invite Duchenne and have a critical thinking series about his idea, you know, that, that would just have a huge blowback from all of the professors at Mount Royal University, or not all of them, sorry, but a significant, loud, 
uh, you know, contingent. And so, you know, you think when you're an organizer of the Rational Space Network, you know, do we really want to duke it out with and, and be called a bunch of white nationalists to boot? Um, you know, we have to sort of think about that. And that's kind of that that's really what makes me really uh, feel feel dismay is that. Uh, you know, you can't really go into any of these things because it's become this sort of uh, forbidden zone uh, to talk about when what it needs is more discussion, not less discussion. And, 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 I, and I think that's really the problem of the universities these days is, is that, you know, we used to be have universities the ideal anyway, that this is where we could kind of get at these ideas in an academic sense and figure out if they were true or not. That, that's that's where that could happen. And now it's a whole bunch of ideologues have managed to entrench themselves in the university. And they say, this is the right way to think. And anyone who doesn't think this is evil. And therefore, um, and they're going to use all these tactics to, to smear the reputations of the people who, who want to have these discussions. Um, and and so what happens is that that none of those areas can really be discussed in the university without serious organization and you know do it uh, yeah yeah it becomes dangerous to kind of even say like hey i i might have a problem with um ricardo duchenne having been mobbed in this way but no one re really wants to say that because oh are, are you also a white nationalist is that why you're defending ricardo yeah. duchenne and i think when it comes to um you know, free speech advocate professors like Jordan Peterson in Canada, he, I don't think he uh, spoke out against about Ricardo Duchenne's situation, or maybe he did quite a bit later. But um, a lot of people were saying like, hey, why aren't you sticking up for Ricardo Duchenne? Well, I'm sure he's very well aware that he will be smeared by association if he, if yeah. he and that's what happened to me. That. That's what happened to me. So um, I knew, uh, I, I sensed I, I was going to need to defend Duchenne at some point, uh, and I did on Twitter. And Matthew Sears from the University of New Brunswick uh, immediately smeared me as a bigot uh, when I did it. Uh, and, and, I, and I knew it was going to happen, so I prepared myself for it. And, and this is something that um, uh, uh, Jonathan Haidt and, and uh, Greg Lukianoff talk about in their book, uh, The Coddling of the American Mind. It's the nature of witch hunts. Um, people, when there's a witch hunt that's happening, people are very, very worried uh, about defending the person who's being accused of being a witch. Because what happens when you do that is that you are labeled a witch yourself. Uh, and so this is kind of what happens with this mob mentality. And, you know, it takes um, someone who, who, well, you have to be prepared for it. And and I am, like, I've, I've been doing this a long enough time that I, I know what's going to happen and I'm prepared psychologically for it. And so that makes it easier because you can kind of steel yourself against it. But if you're not prepared for that and, and, you, and you never really encountered that kind of reaction, um, it can be very, very psychologically debilitating uh, for that to occur. And, and so that's where we're at right now. So uh, with the Rational Space Network, uh, what, what we're tr and also the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship, I should mention that organization because it's the national organization. Um, and you're a board member. Yeah. And I'm a board member there. Mark Mercer is the president of that organization. And, and it's very principled. It defends, um, we defend everyone who is um, having their freedom of expression curtailed, academic freedom curtailed. We defend high um, academic standards. And that national organization is very, very important because it can take the national approach. So I think you need to have both the national approach and also the local university by university approach. And, and that's what we're hoping now with the Rational Space Network is I was just meeting with some people from the University of Lathbridge and they're hoping to start up their own Rational Space Network at, at the University of Lathbridge. And so that's what I'm hoping will happen is just a kind of a multi you know, pronged approach, you know, people can just start up their own and, and sort of use what we're doing as a model. You know, we're, we completely open access. Anyone can use our materials and copy them and just start up their own group so that we can kind of start to build um, some kind of organizational strength. Um, because that's the key is that, you know, people say, you know, why aren't professors standing up? Well, you know, it, it's it's not a very good career. Like if you're if you are ambitious in any way, <laughs> this is not uh, something that's going to appeal to you. 
because you're going to have to slog it out against um, sort of the ideologues uh, for quite a while until the culture, we can actually change the culture. Um, so that's what we're working on now. Um, but we're hoping to build up some kind of organization where those people who are slightly fearful for whatever reason will know that they have some kind of backing. And, and I think that was really Mark Hesch, who, who was re recently under fire at Mount Royal, um, a, a, a number of us from the Rational Space Network defended him, were very, very vocal in defending him and let the administration know that he had support. Uh, at well, that. yeah, if I could just like explain uh, what happened there for those who aren't familiar, those who are not familiar. Um, Mark Hector or Hetched, um, he is a Mount Royal University instructor. So he's, he's not a tenured professor. Nope. He submitted an op-ed to the Vancouver Sun. Um, and, and the topic was something along the lines of... Um, uh, social trust declines in an ethnically diverse society. Uh, I, I can't recall the, yes. the article in its entirety and the, and the studies that were cited because uh, the article was actually removed quite quickly um, from online. I think it only lasted half a day before the Vancouver Sun was absolutely mobbed yes. and told they are white nationalists, white supremacists, they need to remove this, this is hurtful. You know, all the regular lines we hear, right? And so this kind of leaves Mark Hecht probably in a worrisome position at Mount Royal, seeing as he's not tenured and he's now um, probably under a lot of scrutiny. Yes. And um, I, I'm not exactly sure where it stands right now, um, but I did see him interviewed because uh, he just went to UBC with Ricardo Duchenne and, and gave a presentation, which I haven't viewed yet, but um, it's not on video. Um, but uh, he did an interview with Ricardo Duchenne and the uh, UBC students uh, for freedom of expression. And he mentioned on that video that um, he had heard that uh, a group of professors had, and maybe students, I'm not sure who, and this is just speculative because I haven't actually get, got confirmation of this yet, um, but a number of, of professors signed a letter uh, to, uh, which was sent to the provost of Mount Royal University um, demanding that uh, he be barred from campus. Uh, yeah, his own and, campus that he works on. Yeah. If I, uh, and so I was... I was just um, horrified to hear about that, but but this this was a while ago. This happened, I believe, right away. Uh, but still, um, a, a group of us were, you know, defending him on with other, you know, publicly defending him um, and so on. And I think, you know, we'll, we'll see what what unfolds. But we are organized and ready to defend him more if we have to. We we did the initial work. Um, and the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship would become involved if, if but the Mount Royal did act well in this publicly. They they defended his rights to freedom of expression and academic freedom. Um, no one did anything uh, from the administration to him. Um, but it's very alarming when you see professors that are doing this activity, especially doing it secretly. You know, at least with the Duchenne case, you know, people put their names on the letter. So, you know, they were actually, you know, they were doing it publicly. Now you can say you shouldn't do that. Like, I, I think that that was very, very, I thought that was wrong from an academic standpoint to, to do that to a professor, um, to gang up like that. But they were doing, you know, they were doing it publicly. But this was done, I, if it's true, was done secretly. So Hesh doesn't even know what was said about him in this if this is true and so i i'm i'm quite appalled by that situation uh, and i'm i'm not sure what's going to be done about it but at least at the and this was a while ago university didn't do anything about it they defended him and that's the main thing is that you want administrators to act in a principled way and defend faculty what's disturbing is that it's now faculty who are mobbing other faculty members it used to be a problem where administrators were mobbing other faculty members. And Kenneth Westhues, who's a, uh, the main theorist on academic mobbing, writes very interesting material on his website. Um, he's noted that, that, that this is one of the changes that's happened, is that the mobbing is now orchest being orchestrated by professors against other professors, uh, which does not bode well for the future of you know, being able to say contentious things, because it makes you fearful you know, you you start to worry about what you're you're saying, and 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 you you you're reluctant to to you know come forward and to put forward viewpoints that you you see will be might be perceived as being contentious, and you know anyone who's interested in you know intellectual development 
you know, the pursuit of truth, those kinds of ideas, which are very important to a university, you know, should be alarmed about this. Because, you know, we're just dealing with the tip of the iceberg, is that, you know, who's going to, Mount Royal is going to feel that they should be criticizing diversity now. It's going to be, it's going to be very, very, you know, you've got to be very, very strong willed to be able to do it. And, and, you know, many people, you know, they, they, they're just feeling nervous. And, 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 and so this is the environment that we're, we're dealing with. And I really think it's a cultural problem. You know, we have to change the culture at the university. People have to understand that freedom of expression is the highest value that we have. It is not to be balanced with other, you know, ideas and principles you know this is this is if we don't have freedom of expression we are not going to be able to talk about anything and if we can't talk about anything we can't figure out what to do in various contexts and i think it was sam harris who said you know um, freedom of expression is the the highest value because it's it's the it's the value that enables us to determine all our other values and if we get rid of that you know, we, we can't, there's no way to figure anything out anymore. And, and that, that is really a very, very destructive development and is, you know, the path to uh, authoritarianism and totalitarianism. This is creeping into everything that's happening. And, and really, um, we need to band together people who are concerned to be able to fight it, because as an individual, you won't be able to do it. Thank you, Francis, for talking to me today. I'm sure many are very excited to read your book, Separate But Unequal which comes out November 5th, and any listeners who reside in the Calgary area should definitely consider attending an event by the Rational Space Network. They are on Twitter at Space Rational. And True North, we are on Twitter as well, at True North Centre, and our website is tnc.news. Thank you so much for listening, and bye for now.